Howdy. Hungry Pilgrim. Oh well. I was going to spend today chopping wood and stacking it, but it started raining. Uh, fall has finally gotten here, and here it is, the last day of August. Oh well. <laughs> anyway, oh by the way, see this up here? After that 12-year-old kid in Colorado fell uh, victim to the stupidity of uneducated teachers uh, about displaying this, I decided it's my duty to display it too. Because it's absolutely true, it's our own heritage, it's American. Okay, that's my uh, main rant. Oh, and I wanted to say one thing. I, I had a hundred and, no, 888 uh, subscribers. And then I had 885. Well, when, you, when you've got a million subscribers or so, or even a hundred thousand, you don't notice these things. But when you got as puny as I do, you notice. So I uh, looked around, I asked around some of my friends and said, hey, are you still subscribed? And uh, they said, no. And I never turned it off. And they went and resubscribed. I'm up to 186 again. So I don't know what the heck's going on, but it isn't uh, people unsubscribing. It, I mean, some of them might have just unsubscribed, and that's, that's fine. <clears throat> that's your business. But some, I don't think, are. I think it's YouTube unsubscribing them. And I think that's just, well, wrong. Anyway, check and see if you are subscribed. And if you aren't, well, click it again and turn that. I don't know how the hell this works, but, uh, you know, if you can figure it out, figure it out. Well, anyway, I wanted to talk about something. Some years back, I bought a gun, and the fellow I bought it from, uh, <clears throat> he said, well, you know, you're going to need some other stuff with it. And I said, well, I don't know much about it. And he said, well, you know, uh, let me give you a book, and uh, let me show you something. Oh, come here now. Let's see. You see that? This is the book. It's called Proud Promise, and it's about French automatic rifles. And until recently, this was the only book about French automatic rifles. Then Ian McCollum did this book. If you get a commercial copy of it, you're going to find it in a blue cover. I mean, a red cover instead of blue. I was part of his original uh, uh, campaign to, to fund it. So I got a blue one, and it's signed by him, which I think is kind of cool. And it's an excellent book. I've read it a couple of times. And this is the rifle. This is a Moss 49-56. Well, this is a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, an automatic rifle, or well, semi-automatic, from, uh, well, 1949, updated in 1956. Actually, this was first developed as the Moss 44, and actually, if you read through uh, Proud Promise, it was actually the Moss 41, and there was a, a precursor made in 1928, and some other uh, ideas that came out right after World War I. Basically, in World War I, the French were using uh, their main uh, uh, 1895 and later the uh, Berthier, which were bolt-action rifles. And they decided, this is not going to really cut it in the modern world. So after the war, they decided they wanted a, something that was semi-automatic. And uh, they had been using the Shosho, which is basically a uh, machine gun in 8mm lapel. Well, they changed the cartridge they were using to 7.5 by 7.55 by 54. Actually, it was originally 7.55 by 57, but under the Versailles Treaty, they ended up with a whole bunch of German machine guns in uh, 7.92 by 57. And uh, some troops were uh, trying to uh, put that into uh, this. <laughs> and the uh, Moss 41 slash 44, those, those early guns, many of them blew up because if you put a 7.92 into a 7.55, it's not going to work so well. So they changed it and changed it to 7.55 by 54 so that the 57s just won't fit. Anyway, uh, this one is basically that the original, well, let me start over. When uh, France lost World War I originally, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the Germans took over Paris and the surroundings and northern France, 
and left the Vichy government in control of what became southern France, at least for a while, until the, the Nazis took it over, too. Well, they knew that they had what they called the Moss 36. And the Moss 36, well, when they first developed the Moss 44, let me get this out of the way. They were also developing this. This is a Moss 36. And the Moss 36 is a standard bolt-action rifle. Well, let me put it back up here. The Moss 36 was great as a substitute standard rear echelon gun, which is what it was designed for. They had yet to tool up and completely develop for the Moss 44. So uh, they uh, equipped most of their troops with the Moss 36. Uh, all of the troops on the Maginot line were carrying Moss 36s. Well, the Germans didn't go through uh, the Maginot line. They did a sweep down through Belgium and um, the forest, that, I forget the name of the forest there, that came through. But it was a uh, sweeping victory because they uh, uh, did a blitzkrieg, a lightning war, on the, on the French from that direction. Not on the, um, the main Maginot line, which was the entire <coughs> border between uh, France and Germany. So, they lost. Well, what they did is they took the, uh, all of the drawings on this, all of the uh, uh, tooling, and everything and put it into hiding so the Germans wouldn't find it. Well, that, uh, that, that was stashed early on and was taken down to, uh, uh, well, Vichy at first and then uh, later on just stashed. <laughs> and uh, they did not uh, let the Germans know that. They, if they came across any, uh, that th they were half built somewhere in a, um, like uh, Saint Etienne in the uh, arsenal there, they said, that, What is that? Well, the stock here and the fore-end look a lot like a Moss 36. So they said, oh, that's just a Moss 36 that we screwed up. And the German uh, inspector went, oh, okay, well, next, show me some of your FN 1922s or your, uh, your uh, uh, mob pistols or the like, or even your uh, earlier uh, 1935s, A's and S's, because we want those for our uh, uh, Luftwaffe pilots and or uh, uh, even gendarmes and stuff that, that are going to be... Uh, uh, armed with uh, for local uh, stuff. So uh, they didn't know about this all through the war. Well, the minute the Allies uh, liberated France, they started immediately to tool up to make these again. Well, they made several different iterations of it, and uh, Proud Promise goes through all the iterations. And by 1949, they had settled on this design. And then in 1946, they did an update, uh, 1956, they did an update of it. And this is actually the rifle that France used <coughs> throughout the, uh, well, the 1950s and into the early 60s. Uh, all of the, um, the French in the Algerian War carried this. 90% of the French and the uh, Vietnamese, what became the Vietnamese, uh, they were fighting against the Viet Minh in the Indochina War, carried these. Some of them carried uh, cut-down uh, Berthiers and... Uh, 1895s and the like, uh, but uh, this was the standard. Uh, the soldiers at Dien Ben Phu were carrying this. Incidentally, most of those soldiers, which were in the French Foreign Legion, they were actually former SS and other uh, uh, <coughs> Weimar uh, German soldiers who, uh, for one reason or another, wanted to avoid uh, questions about their activities. <coughs> Excuse me, I've still got this sinus issue. And we're uh, hanging out in the French Foreign Legion because at the end of your service you're given a French citizenship, a new name, passports, etc. and you can go anywhere in the world and you're uh, covered. You're not, your, your original records are sealed in the uh, Foreign Legion uh, vaults and no one can question them, which they thought was a pretty good deal. So, you know, you know win in Rome. Anyway, this is the rifle I bought. Well, I bought, I got the Proud Promise book, which, like I said, until Ian's book came out, that was the only book on French rifles of the time. It's uh, rare and you can't get it anymore. Well, the guy who sold it to me, he also had some of these. These are the uh, magazine pouches for, the, for it and a few other things. This is the armorer's kit for it. Now, what's interesting about the magazine, you'll notice this clip on it. It's on not on the, the gun itself. Let me show you. Can I pull one of these? Oh, yeah. It's actually on the magazine. Uh, 
I, it's just a, it was a uh, engineering decision on the part of the engineers in um, Saint Etienne to, to make it this way, and it worked out pretty darn well. A, a soldier at Dien Bien Phu might carry one of at least one of these magazine pouches on his belt, probably two, and uh, I have two. Other interesting things about this: this particular rifle came standard equipped with a grenade launcher. Uh, the grenade launchers are, are, well, the grenades are unavailable these days, and I don't think it's uh, a no-no to have one with this on it, because uh, you can't even get those, even dummy grenades anymore. This is a locked breech, uh, roller-delayed, blowback sort of, uh, a um, roller-locked uh, uh, gun, and it's uh, gas-operated and stuff. I mean, it's, a, it's your typical uh, battle rifle of the 1950s and 60s. This was what France used when everybody else was using either the FN, FAL, or the Heckler & Koch uh, G3, uh, which was based on the, uh, well, mainly on, on the uh, MG42, no, not MG, uh, what was it called? The, the, S, the uh, Sturmgewehr SG42, I think. And then later on the uh, Setme, the, uh, the uh, Spanish one that was built by the same engineers. You know, they'd, they'd gone over to France after World War II. Uh, they were working, I think, at Mauser, and they'd been uh, uh, picked up by uh, the French and were working in Saint Etienne to uh, de perfect and develop things. And what they were into was not the same as what the French were into, so uh, they thought, well, this is no good. And so they were putting feelers out everywhere to get uh, different work. And the, the Spanish said, well, come on down and, and work for us. And they did, and they developed the, uh, the Setme. Well, when they went back to Germany, uh, after uh, the partition of Germany, and went back to West Germany, they, they helped found Heckler & Koch, and they brought that design with them. And the uh, G3 was the result. And uh, the FNFAL was called the, uh, the uh, right hand of the free world. Uh, yeah, it was. <laughs> uh, and... A lot of the uh, little bush wars in Africa were either fought with, like I said, the FNFAL or the G3. And most of the um, uh, Western powers were using, uh, well, one or the other. And the Eastern uh, backed ones were using SKSs or later AK 47s. But this was on uh, uh, the Allied side or the, uh, the NATO side. And uh, this was still chambered in 7.55 by 54. When uh, I think it was Century Arms imported a whole bunch of these, they got this bright idea to rechamber all of them for 308 and sold them uh, that away. And uh, yeah, this one has been rechambered, I'm sorry to say. But uh, the other problem is, is the French use an extremely hard primer on their guns. And this thing uses an inertial firing pin. That means that when it fires, it, it slams forward and hits the, uh, the primer. And then slams back. There's no spring in there. So that uh, then when it chambers the next round, it might go boop, and just do a, a little peck on the uh, the primer of the next one. Well, with the hard primers the French use, that was not a problem. But with modern commercial primers, that little peck will actually set off the second primer. So these things were known for double feeding. Bam, bam, instead of bam. So uh, what you do is you go to this little company in Texas that sells a uh, modified firing pin with a spring on it, which when you uh, pull the regular firing pin, which by the way, I have the regular firing pin in here, uh, and extra springs for this one in here, uh, this will not uh, slam fire again and set off the second round. So this has been modified so that it does shoot one at a time. Uh, some of these, the, the reaming of the uh, chamber was not done very accurately, and <clears throat> because of that, they, they get uh, jammed up all the time. This one has fired a few thousand rounds through it, and it does just fine. Uh, it's a beautiful rifle. I, I like it. It's a, a, a big, heavy battle rifle. This is not an assault rifle. This is a battle rifle. Uh, originally, when the French made it, they realized people are not the same size, so they made this uh, stock extender on the on the rear of it. Can you see that? Uh, this stock extender uh, brings it out just a little bit. There's um, two or three of these, and depending on, on how big you are, you would get the larger or 
the larger of two or three. This is the one right in the middle. Uh, I'm 5'11", 5'12", you know, somewhat. I was 6'3", until uh, I got old. And uh, you, get, you shrink when you get older. And uh, when, I was, uh, when I was in my prime, I could shoot this, and this fit perfectly. It still fits me okay. It doesn't fit as well as it did when I was younger. But um, it's, a, it's a good rifle. It, it doesn't look like much. It's, it's not pretty. It's serviceable. Uh, it, does not, uh, it doesn't jam. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's just a simple battle rifle. And it, uh, it works pretty darn well. Let me show you something. I'm going to spin it around. Yeah, it won't hit there. This is the other side. You can see it's got rings. And uh, it's just, <clears throat> it's an elegant rifle. Not fancy, but elegant. And like I said, with a uh, blank in the chamber and a grenade on it, you can uh, adjust the gas on this and adjust this out so that you uh, uh, can... Uh, say whether it's going to be 50 yards or 150 yards for your grenade. And I think this thing, yeah, you, uh, you pull that, oh gosh, that's right, this thing is stuck in that position. But this thing, this part here should angle up like that. And then you use the rear sight and this and angle it up. By the way, don't ever stick, when you're shooting a grenade, don't ever stick it in your shoulder. You stick it on the ground and then aim that way. Uh, it, most people who uh, try it with their shoulder end up with a broken collarbone. So that's not a, a very good idea. Well, I've never tried it because I've never had a grenade on this. I can't, I don't think you can get them. I looked for dummies just so I could uh, make a, a presentation with, with a grenade in place, but uh, can't be done. Alas. Anyway, just a, just a discussion of the, uh, of the gun and the rare book about it. This is a very rare book. Uh, it was made by, uh, what is it called, a Collector Grade Publications, who made a lot of interesting books. But uh, this particular one is just, it's unobtainium. And I happen to have a copy. I mean, I like to get, well, I do a lot of reading. Uh, you find more information in books these days than you do on the Internet, because people didn't have the Internet when they were writing us. <clears throat> I mean, this is a 4956. Not exactly a, a time when you could go get on Instagram. So uh, you know, it's just just a really cool old old world rifle. Uh, not, you know, I I I would say this is a, a comparable to the FN forty nine, which by the way I've got a book on too. I should have one. I did not buy it back when I had a chance, and I kicked myself many times over that. It's also similar to the Hakim of. Uh, or the AG-42 from Sweden, Hakim's from Egypt, and uh, many others of that era, when the, when the semi-automatic was just being uh, developed. Anyway, that's all I wanted to talk about today. And uh, like I said, click click a subscribe if you forgot to, or, or take a look and make sure you are subscribed if you watch this. Anyway, happy trails!